Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of A Spot of Science. I'm Gus. I'm Chris. And I'm Sally. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, this episode of A Spot of Science is brought to you by Movement Watches. I absolutely love the watch they sent me. It's sleek, stylish, and I always get tons of compliments when I wear it out. Movement was started by two broke college kids that wanted to wear stylish watches but couldn't afford them, so they started their own watch company. The watches start at just $95, and at department stores, you're looking at $400 to 500 bucks. Movement figured out that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible price. You get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmtwatches.com slash science. That's mvmtwatches.com slash science. Join the movement. You can get a watch like me. Except mine's better because it's I'm wearing it. First question. That's it, first question. So we have a question here submitted by Casey. Casey says, so this has been bothering me for a long time, though it's a really gender-specific question. Are there any advantages to having a period as opposed, as opposed to whatever other mammals are doing? Well, I'm not exactly an expert on periods. Tell us about uh, periods, Chris. I can't imagine that's the best way to do it because it seems like, I mean, there's like, you know, blood coming out. It, that is it's correct. It's uncomfortable. That is also correct. It, it, it's, you know... It's not fun. Any, any, I don't know any anything that's. I don't know anyone who's like I love my periods. They're so much, <laughs> so much fun. The only people who love their periods pretty much are the people who are like, yeah, I'm not pregnant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it seems like to me eggs would be an easier, like laying eggs. Yeah, maybe because it depends. Have you seen the kiwi, the bird? No. It lays the biggest egg in relation to its body size. I think it's about twenty five percent. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, uh. <laughs> so that wouldn't be an easier option. But like, if you had just like how okay, the human egg is just like a few cells, right? It's like I was gonna say, it's not that just, big. Yeah. It's just it's yeah, very small. It's a cell. If you just had to lay that egg, yeah, that'd be way you, easier. You would not notice that at all. Yeah. So what about that? Then you'd have to find it. <laughs> that, that would be <laughs> that would be really difficult. So what are you saying? Are the so you're saying there are no advantages to periods over anything else? I. We, um, Do you know what the alternatives are? Uh, well, eggs. Yeah, let's think about um, mammals. Just or or Mar you could no. I'm trying to think of other ways. I mean, I guess. What is a period? We should start off oh. with. <laughs> <laughs> I like that nervous laughter. It's like you're asking like a middle school boy. Um, so okay, a period know. is is the the wall the the lining of the uterus shedding after uh, the egg. Is no long no the egg does not attach. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, look at you, <laughs> Mr. Ninth Grade Health. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's yeah, entirely yeah. right. So why is it doing that? Why can't it just like chill? And like why does it have to come off every month? Okay, so firstly, what are the alternatives to having a period? Okay. The we are very unusual among animals in having a period. It's only evolved three times, but it has evolved three times independently. So there's us and the other primates, um, in particular chimpanzees and gibbons. <clears throat> there are certain species of bats and there are elephant shrews. And no other mammal has periods. We're going to stick with mammals just because birds, it's a bird egg isn't the lining of the womb. It's kind of the entirety of, because birds don't have wombs, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so it's, kind of the womb, the placenta, the egg in it, is in everything. Um, but within mammals, the other option is to reabsorb the wall, the endometrium. And so rather than um, shedding it every month, they can just reabsorb it if it's not fertilized. But, and there is a big but to this, it's all about this thing called uh, spontaneous decidualization. Uh -huh. Tell us more about that, Chris. Spontaneous uh, decision. Uh, no, you seem excited to talk about it. You go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so uh, generous of you. Uh, so it's all about parent offspring conflict. What many people don't realize is that mothers and fetuses are at war with each other because fetuses want to extract as many nutrients and energy and resources from the mother as possible because that's what's going to make that fetus grow bigger and stronger and more likely to survive. The mother, particularly if she wants to have future offspring, doesn't want to give up all of her resources to that one particular fetus that she's got inside of her at that point in time. She wants to save some for future ones. And so there's this huge conflict between the offspring trying to grab resources and the mother trying to protect herself from that. And 
this it's like tug of war. Yeah, exactly. And this leads to whole... On the umbilical cord. <laughs> yeah. Well, the placenta is kind of a huge part of the action, actually, because half of it is fetal material and half of it is mother's material. Like Genetically, it's got two components hmm. to it. And a big part of the placenta is trying to manage that parent-offspring conflict. Um, so there's this thing called spontaneous decidualization. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's... It's really cool, actually, because if you are a species that has it, it means that you as a mother can control when you get pregnant. So rather than a embryo fertilizing and coming into you, the wall of your womb and then you developing this thick endometrium around it, you can control. OK, this is the time when I'm going to build up my endometrium, going to have a thick, bloody, juicy wall lining. And then if a fertilized egg comes in <laughs> as a result, then it can implant. So they, they can have so much more say in when an en an embryo can implant. It's like the, the weirdest dirty talk ever. It's like, ooh, <laughs> I built up a thick, dirty intro. <laughs> Well, essentially, that's, what, dirty wall for that's you. what ovulation is. And women, they've shown are more attractive during ovulation. They've looked at strippers um, and they've scientists went into strip clubs and asked the strippers. Sure, okay, like, we're going to do some you, research. This can you record the tips that you receive over the on the days of the month? And they compared and also record when you get your period. And they found that the number of the amount of money that they earn significantly increased at the time of their ovulation which is at the time when their womb lining is building up so yeah maybe you should be saying i'm feeling so sexy tonight my endometrium is <laughs> so bloody right now thick. oh yeah <laughs> thick and bloody i can't wait for a fertilized egg to drill into me <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i yeah burrow in like yeah send your sperm we'll get that zygote burrowing in and bathing in my blood <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the embryo can either sit on the surface of the wall. So imagine like, this is the outside of the womb. This is the inside of the womb. This is the little embryo. It can either just sit on the surface, like I think a lot of horse embryos do. It can burrow a tiny bit into the surface, so just enough to get blood. But humans and these other species that have periods, the embryo burrows all the way, pretty much to the almost to the other side of the wall. So part of having a very thick endometrium is to protect the womb from this burrowing embryo. Like it's It sounds like it's being attacked. It's so I mean, oh, I man. just hate the idea of pregnancy. It's like you've got this parasite growing inside you for nine months that alters your physiology and your brain and sucks resources out of you, then bursts out. Then it like, grows in your house for 18 years. Yeah, it's <laughs> friggin' freaky, but it's so freaky. And so part of it is that we have particular particularly um, almost selfish embryos that want to burrow all the way through and steal as many resources as possible. There's also another part of it, which is that we have, we have them for 18 years and we have them inside our bodies for nine months. That is a long period of time. And so our kids are very expensive in terms of resources compared to, I don't know, like a a mouse that will have loads and loads and loads of them and um so if you've got a, a dud kid it doesn't <laughs> matter whereas if we have a dud kid and you've spent all of those resources on it that's going to be a huge problem so having a thick wall they found that the the endometrium itself can spot genetic abnormalities in the embryo so that it will not allow an embryo to implant if it thinks that that embryo is so genetically malformed that it won't be able to develop into a healthy child and we're more likely to have genetically a, a, a bigger variation in genetic health of our embryos because we have eggs that take about three or four days to go from the ovaries into the uterus and so your egg can be about three or four days old when it gets fertilized all that time degenerating sperm can be about six or seven days old and still fertilize an egg and over all of this time you can build up um, de defects in it so that you're more likely to get a genetic, a weird mutant. Uh, not that all mutants are bad, but if you do have a bad mutation, and so it's important that your endometriums can screen that out. And so periods are because a sign that the mother is in control, both for her own good and for the genetic health of her kid. And we see it in cases where females want to have control over their 
own reproductive biology, which makes me hate my periods an awful lot less because uh, they're bloody annoying, literally. So I did have a follow up question to something you said. Yeah. You said that uh, the embryo could be rejected if, yes. you know, uh, genetic, if it doesn't seem like it's um, genetically okay. Mm -hmm. Is that like, could that lead to a miscarriage? Is that what, like, maybe a cause of a miscarriage? It wouldn't even be a miscarriage at that point because it won't have implanted. Oh, so it just doesn't even. Take. It's, a, it's a fertilized egg that just gets rejected. Yes. So I think for it to be a miscarriage, it has to have implanted into the wall. Oh, ah, okay. That's, I didn't even realize it, it could be stopped even that early, yeah. even before that. That's heavy. I've, yeah, heavy flow. <laughs> Real heavy with clots. I've got a, a question here for you. Uh, hey, first off, really, really enjoy the show. Yay. Are there any animals that have an ability to resist dental decay? And that's from Daniel. Resist? I mean, you mean more so than what we already do? Uh, like an animal that can resist dental decay. Because you think about it, like humans have to brush yeah. their teeth, they go to the dentist and everything. Um, yes, those that continue to grow teeth and forever. Because then they don't ever need to like, worry about... I love it decay. when you look towards me. Just for, like, <laughs> please confirm like what like I'm saying. Like if a tooth falls true. out, like then another just, one comes Another in. one pops out. Another one pops like out. Like sharks. sharks. Sharks have like exactly. all those rows and of just, teeth. They're just like, so it doesn't matter about dental decay because they're just rejected. Ah, well, screw this. I'm no tooth. Um... <laughs> So that yes, and I would say, and so, so, al and also you know other animals like brush their teeth. They like chew wood and stuff. I think being a shark dentist would be like, <laughs> like a not a lucrative <laughs> career at all. Well, no, there are whole fish that clean a fish that go in and oh. that that fish will leave that swim into these cleaning areas and go, and then these little fish will kind of and uh, pick away the dead bits of skin and dead bits of fish from their teeth. Interesting. So that is, it's actually a really lucrative business. Such So lucrative that there are cheetah fish that pretend they dress up like the cleaner fish. Um, well, they don't dress up, they're, they're, they're yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then they'll go in and then take a bite out of the fish that they're cleaning. Wow. And, and then, yeah, so there's this huge thing. Sorry, you were talking about teeth. I just wanted to interject. Yeah. There. Well, so that's, that's not. So that's you think answer. that. Yeah, it, yeah. So. Yes, the, uh, there are many animals that continuously grow, so sharks and um, a lot of herbivores that eat grass. So, for example, an elephant um, has huge long teeth. Like the tooth is probably about that long um, and it slowly wears away and wears away and wears away and then it will die once it runs out of tooth. Really? Um, there oh, we go. That... So the plate at the bottom, that's the bit that would do the chewing and then that whole thing, like shark teeth, will kind of grow in and wear upwards. And so once it then reached the other end of that, then it would um, it just dies. run out of tooth and die if it hadn't died of something else. Is every one of those ridges like another tooth waiting to come in? Well, it, it's all one continuous tooth. Right, like, like a new surface or is it just like constantly getting worn I down? I think it's just constantly getting worn wow. down. <laughs> I'm just trying to be like, oh, out of tooth. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's, essentially. It's like, oh, out of tooth. And it's going to be a slow, painful death as well because yeah. it's it's starvation. But at that point, it's had a good long life because it's it's lived to the... If you've lived so that you're long in the tooth or short in the tooth, then uh, then you're doing well. Yeah, yeah. you've probably reproduced by that point, so you're okay. So yeah. you've succeeded biologically. Exactly. And rodents, their incisors um, constantly sharpen because the front edge of the tooth is slightly harder than the inside edge of the tooth and so when they're constantly gnawing away at things the back edge uh, wears down faster so it always has this slanty angle mm. to create a nice sharp point and that's why if you've got like hamsters or rabbits or stuff they always need something to chew on because they're sharpening their teeth um yeah there are some animals that will chew on bones and stuff but the biggest factor in animal dental health is the fact that they don't eat sugary food like we do so we have a very high sugar diet and it's the sugars that feed the bacteria in our mouths that produces mm. the acid that causes dental decay. And if you're eating a low sugar diet, it's much less likely to cause decay or it takes a lot longer time to cause decay. The other side of the story is that animals do get dental decay and die of it a lot. Like if you get dental decay and you're an animal, you're dead because there aren't any dentists. And there are animals, the vast majority of animals don't live long enough to reach the point where their teeth would decay. And so they're dead before. So if you, so animals in captivity, they spend an awful lot of time brushing their teeth and making sure that their teeth are clean because they're living longer and mm. they're getting to the point where actually it would be a problem. And they give them, like they, they, they actually do surgeries on things like lions because they can have terrible abscesses and they can't do anything about it. And in the wild, they would die if they got to that age. 
and they would and like I'm talking about elephants and many other mammals where their teeth just wear down to when they're flat then they die of starvation because they can no longer chew their food it's just a matter of life what how do you die of a toothache uh, infection you, just infection so infection and it can get into the blood so dental health um, they're slowly realizing has a huge impact on the rest of the body because if you have inflammation in your mouth, it um, triggers the inflammation response, which isn't just specific to your mouth. So then you get inflammation throughout your whole body and that can cause other diseases. So but, actually your to your dental health is more important than you would think. It doesn't just affect your mouth. Poor dental health, isn't it also, like it can lead to like heart failure and exactly, heart problems? Exactly, because of the link through um, inflammation. Wow. Mm -hmm. So take care of your teeth. Do. Or, and that's a Brit telling you to do yeah. that. <laughs> or if you're a shark, just go to the fish and open up your mouth. Yeah. I feel like I learned a lot about elephants. I learned about their feet, their toenails, and yep. uh, now their teeth and what they look like. So uh, I just want to say thanks for watching, guys.